Great. Wow. It's as though Ted has put the whole of the imposter syndrome and concentrated it on this, on this red circle. I don't know how, how they've managed that. You've got time at the end. Come and stand here. It really is truly bizarre. Uh, I want you all to think about what sort of job or career or profession is really worthwhile. When someone tells you they do such and such, and you think, wow, that's, that's a good thing to be doing. Perhaps think back to when you were at school and the sorts of careers or jobs that your teachers um, sort of reserved for, for, the, for the very brightest. Or perhaps when you ask uh, children, what do you want to do when you grow up? Something they commonly uh, come up with. Think of a, of a job or a, a career uh, where you make a real and profound difference to people, where every day is different, uh, where there's a challenge, where it's a secure job, the pay's reasonably good, and a job that has high social standing, and where, in general, your customers are very happy and grateful. And I don't think that I'd be wrong if I'd say that for a lot of you, you think about medicine and being a doctor as one of those professions. Indeed, if you look at all the, uh, the surveys about jobs that uh, people look up to, people trust, they trust their doctors and their physicians. And perhaps, therefore, it's not surprising that every year very many people apply to universities and to medical schools uh, to study uh, medicine and become doctors. But the places to study medicine are strictly limited. So, so why is that? Well, there are a number of reasons. Firstly, it's very expensive to train doctors. Secondly, the, the sort of capacity for well-supervised clinical placements to give them the experience they need are also very limited. And so because of that, uh, most medical schools in the UK, in America and overseas, they'll get 10, 12, 20 applicants for every place. But despite that, people carry on applying. Now, many people who apply to study medicine, uh, they do it because they've got a very real and strong vocation to study medicine. They have what I'm going to call a medicine-shaped hole or a doctor-shaped hole inside them. They won't be satisfied if they do anything else. Now, these people could be doing lots of other things with their lives, and there are lots of very good and satisfying uh, careers. But at the end of the day, when all is said and done, when they come to their end of their lives, they'll look back, and if, if they haven't been a doctor, if they haven't studied medicine, they'll still have that doctor medicine-shaped hole inside of them. Some of you will recognise that. If you recognise it yourself, come talk to me afterwards, and we'll talk about how you could uh, start a, a career in medicine. It's something that I recognised uh, in, my, in myself. Now, um, I think that's why people sacrifice a great deal to study medicine, both financially in terms of their, their work-life balance. But not everyone is like that. So there are plenty of people that I work with, and yeah, in moments of honesty, they say, well, I really didn't have that very strong vocation. What happens is that if you're moderately good at science, at physics, chemistry, or biology, you do quite well at school, it is easy for your teachers to put pressure on you, uh, both either sort of overt or, or, or sort of subliminal pressure, to go and study medicine, because that's, after all, that's what bright people do who are good at sciences. So it's not to say that those individuals can't become very good doctors or even great doctors. But the reality is that some of them start off well, but then become disillusioned with the career. They become disappointed uh, with the, the career. 
um, they find that it, it's just too much for them. Um, and for that person, it can become a bit of a shock because they've spent all their life, many years of study, wanting to be a doctor, and suddenly they wake up one day and realise this isn't really what I want to do. And for them, it can be a, it can, it can be a crisis uh, moment in their life, and they realise it's not really what they want to do. It's not the life they want for themselves or their family. Now, nevertheless, I still think the vast majority of people who apply to study medicine do it because they've got this strong vocation. And the difficulty we have then is how are we going to choose the right person to come to medical school? How are we going to make sure that the person is right for medicine and medicine is right for that person? Now, uh, for those of you who haven't looked recently, I'll tell you if, you, if you look at the admissions website of any medical school uh, in the United Kingdom, I, it, in fact, it's true in, in the world that I've looked at, and you look at the admissions criteria to study medicine, the first thing that you'll come across is the academic criteria. It's front and centre, this is what you need. And it will say that you need three A's at A level and a string of A's at GCSE or a 2-1 degree or an, a master's or high grade point average. Um, so if you look at any of those websites, what it tells you is that most important thing, that you, the most sort of key barrier that you have to overcome if you want to study medicine is that academic hurdle. If you've got those three A's at A level or two one degree, good grade point average, then you've passed that initial hurdle and yes, medicine is something that you can uh, as aspire to. But I want you to think for a minute and say, what are the attributes that you actually want from a doctor? So think about the last time you were unwell or perhaps members of your family that have suffered a, 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 an illness, uh, what are the attributes, the skills, the sort of person that you want to be uh, your doctor? So I sit on the, on the regulator disciplinary panel, General Medical Council, uh, and when I look at that, when I look at uh, complaints about uh, uh, doctors, the recurring theme is that people are unhappy because their doctors don't listen, they're arrogant, they're unkind, they're over-paternalistic. So sure, it's important that your doctor knows their stuff, isn't it? I mean, none of us want to go to a doctor that can't diagnose us, uses the wrong tablets in the wrong dose. Who here wants to go under a knife of a surgeon who doesn't know their anatomy? So that, that competence is really imp important. Um, but my view is that the academic standards that we are placing in front of people to study medicine are far higher than what you actually need to be a good doctor. I actually don't think that you need three A's at A level and be academically bright to be a good, caring doctor. So I was on call last weekend. I was surrounded by doctors, frankly, I didn't think were particularly bright, uh, but most of them were, were good Good, good doctors. But yet, if you want to be a doctor, you look at the admission site, the first barrier that is put in front of you is that academic qualification barrier. So, so why is this? You know, why have we got ourselves into this situation? Well, it's basically because it's the easiest way of filtering out when you've got too many applicants for a, a, a course. Um, and those A-level grades have gone up exponentially, worse than, than house price inflation. So when I applied to do medicine, three Bs was fine to get into to medical school. You could get an, actually got an offer for, for three Cs at A-level. But as the number of people applying to do medicine has increased, and as the number of places have remained static, then there's been that inflation. So we've gone now to three As, two A-stars, uh, or, or, or even higher. 
So what we're doing is we're recruiting highly able academic individuals, uh, or at least ones that are good at e exams. But I think we're missing the point, really, uh, because what we're not doing is looking at those other factors. So I'm talking about things like kindness, uh, things like humility, being able to work in a team, empathy, and collaboration. So, so where are those tested for in traditional A-level subjects or, or, or degree subjects? Um, so there'll be people with a string of A's who've really got, not got any of that. And there are people who have all those attributes that we want from our individual doctors when, when we need a doctor who haven't quite got those, those A's at, at, at A-level. Uh, and so they don't even get past the first hurdle. They, they don't even get to the interview uh, stage of, of medical school. So what I'm suggesting is that we need to radically change our admissions process for programmes like, like medicine. Um, sure, we need to decide what the minimum academic standard is for you to be a, a good doctor. But I'm saying that three A's is not the minimum. I think that's just an artificially inflated academic barrier. And we're only using it because it's an easy thing to, to measure. What we need to do is turn it on its head. We need to say the first barrier is to select people who are kind, empathetic, who are motivated to do their best, who are resilient. And by resilient, I don't mean just sort of carrying on hitting your head against that sort of a brick wall in the hope that the wall will break before your, your head does. It's about carrying on when things are not necessarily going well and to reflecting on when sometimes that's your fault and when sometimes it's the, it's the fault of the system. I think our admissions processes should be explicit to say, if you want to study medicine, these are the first things that you need to prove to us. And then once you've done that, we'll just check to make sure you've got the academic ability to get through uh, the course. So when you apply to do medicine or if you're, in, if you're an admissions uh, lead, does this person in front of me have those attributes that I want for a future uh, doctor? So I suggest that we need to really take down all those web pages for uh, on admissions, uh, remove the first bit that says three A's at A level, and say, in order to study medicine, these are the skills and attributes that we require. And by the way, if you can sh demonstrate you have these, then there are some academic standards uh, and, and requirements in order to, for you to be successful uh, in the course. So there are some mechanisms available. We're only just beginning to use those. There's this variety of situational judgment tests. So there's a test called CASPER, so I don't have any shares in CASPER, but CASPER is a test where you uh, put in front of people a series of video scenarios that specifically test these, uh, these attributes of, sort of sacrificialness, of grit, of determination, of empathy, of being able to, to, to listen. So what I'm suggesting is we start with those tests first and think about the academic qualifications uh, later. Now, I don't expect um, your typical 17 or 18-year-olds to be the fully formed... Yeah, I think back to what I was like when I was 17 or 18. I think back to what I was like a few years ago. Slight embarrassment, isn't it? So, but what we want to do is identify people who can learn these skills. And that Apart from that medicine doctor-shaped hole inside them, they've also got this other hole of those attributes that are trainable and that it will develop as they mature. And so, uh, ladies and gentlemen, I'm suggesting that you all have a little think about how we admit people, not just to medicine, but to some of these other professions, and to think whether we've just got ourselves into a system where we're using really the wrong entry criteria. We're relying on academic A-level grades or university, you know, two, one or first, because it's just been an easy thing to do. And to ask yourself, it may be easy, but is it the right thing to do? 
And after we've, we've all got skin in this game, so I look around the room, so unless you happen to die suddenly, I don't have a big subarachnoid hemorrhage or get run over on the way home, the reality that the future we all face is a chronic decline in our health, and we will all need doctors and nurses and caring professionals. And so we've all got skin in this game because the people that we want to look after us are going to be the people who have these skills and attributes. So when I'm on my sort of sick bed, the fact that someone's got three A's and a first from Oxbridge isn't necessarily going to make me feel particularly good if they can't listen to me or they can't respond to my, to my needs. So I, I suggest you, you know, we all just go away and have a little think about how we decide who we choose, not just for medicine, but for some of the other caring professions, for some of the other uh, careers like, like, uh, like teaching, uh, and think to ourselves, have we got that admission process right? So thank you very much for listening to me. I'm going to get out of this imposter syndrome uh, circle, and now I suddenly feel much more comfortable. Thank you. <laughs>